Well, some time ago, I retired, and uh, I'm glad to be pulled out of retirement. But shortly after being retired, I decided that, and I think I may have already been in the process of exploring this, but going through Jesus' miracles. And I read, I'm sure that I read through Ministry of Healing um, because it is so illuminating to have this particular gift, the spirit of prophecy. And uh, anyway, I'm going to share some of the things that uh, I found fascinating. It was a great learning experience for me. I found that most everybody who writes on the topic agrees that there are 35 specific miracles that seem to have been elaborated. And um, it's more than just having been mentioned, having mentioned something. Um, so of those 35, 23 of the miracles are healing miracles. I found that seven of them were done on the Sabbath. Six of those, um, 23 who were healed, had been demon-possessed. Five of those who were healed had been blind. There were two individuals who were paralyzed. Two miracles were performed for 11 individuals who had leprosy. In addition to the 23 healing miracles, there were two miraculous catches of fish. There were three individuals who were raised from the dead. I guess they qualify for being healed too, don't they? <laughs> healed of the sickness of death. Um, but anyway, I put them there. <clears throat> three involved food. Once Jesus calmed a storm. Another time he walked on water. On another occasion, he sent Peter to uh, go fishing, not with a net, I think, but just cast a hook in the water, and the fish that you catch is going to be uh, loaded with money, <laughs> sufficient to take care of your tax and mine, because Peter had a habit of putting his foot in his mouth, right? And there was one other time where he cursed a fig tree, but... Maybe you've discovered this. There are others who Jesus healed whose stories have not been elaborated. One of them is found in Luke 8, um, where Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and it says many others were healed. There is another who was healed, but the Gospels don't record the circumstances of his healing. His name was Simon the Pharisee, at least that's what two of the gospel writers allude to him as. Um, pardon me, one, it was Luke who identified him that way. But Matthew and Mark identify him as a leper. Well, you know, he, was, he had a dinner party. He was expressing gratitude for what Jesus did for him, and that is specifically healing him of his leprosy. We know nothing about the circumstances but he was grateful, which is good. And he had this party, which was good, but he had something else to learn. And, uh, and we'll elaborate on that a little bit later. Um, so if we add these four that we know of, to the ones that we know of, the 35, plus the extra individuals who were blind in one situation and demon-possessed in another, and the nine who did not return to thank Jesus for healing of them of leprosy, we have 50 incidences where individuals were healed. But the story goes on. There are at least 14 other occasions where there were groups of people who were healed, including those who were present at the feeding of the 5,000. It says that Jesus had healed a number of people who were there. And that is replicated for the story of the feeding of the 4,000. He again engaged in healing, but there is no particular specificity with regard to who the beneficiaries were. There are also two cleansings of the temple, which he replicated his pattern of ministry. Um, the title of the sermon has to do with Jesus, um, uh, how did they put it? Jesus' uh, purpose-driven ministry. It seems like he followed a pattern of healing people. He, he, he mingled with men as one who desired their uh, good. Uh, he had compassion on them. He met their needs and ministered to those needs. Then he bade them, follow me. So Jesus was in the business of mingling and winning the confidence of people so that uh, 
they could learn the true path of salvation, which was not bound up in the rules and regulations that the Jews found themselves in. And so at the end of Jesus' ministry, he also cleansed the temple, at which time he repeated his pattern, his purpose-driven ministry to minister to the needs of the people. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 14, it says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. And I found about ten other occasions uh, where Jesus was engaged in healing. And with all the crowds that Jesus ministered to, there's probably no way of knowing how many people he healed. I tried to speculate, and it's probably worthless, but you can speculate at home if you want. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's fair to put a number on something that we're not so sure of, but he's, he, he did this for three and a half years. So how many people, how many sick people did he come in contact with? Uh, we don't know. John, I think at the end of his book, makes some reference to there being not enough room in the world for the books that could be written about Jesus. <clears throat> well, why did Jesus perform these miracles? We've alluded to it a little bit. But was he so filled with compassion that he couldn't help himself? You can probably pick, picture a mother maybe going and mixing with uh, some orphan children. You know, a mother's nature is this just that she is driven to care for children, especially if she's had her own. And then she finds these helpless children. Was that the situation in which Jesus found himself? He just couldn't help himself but heal people. Well, we know that he was in Nazareth the second time, the last time. And it says that he left without being able to heal very many people because of their lack of faith. So in spite of Jesus' desire to heal, as many people as he could. Uh, he wasn't as successful as he would have liked to have been, but it was because of a lack of faith. But I wonder too, and I think there's an illustration that we're gonna close with, that Jesus had a purpose for healing people. Did he have a specific purpose for the people who were leprous? Let's pick on Simon the leper for a moment. We know that he was a Pharisee, self-righteous, and not in the business of confessing his sin to anybody. He didn't want to be accountable to anybody, just piggybacking on James' comments in our Sabbath school class. But I suspect, and maybe you suspect as well, that Jesus healed him for a particular reason. And it wasn't merely to heal him of the leprosy, but because it was, a, it was really a metaphor about Simon's lack of spirituality. He was all in the business of criticizing like good Pharisees do. But Jesus wanted him to realize that this leprosy represented his spiritual condition, and he had not yet, even though he was grateful to Jesus, he had not come yet to that point in his experience where he recognized his spiritual need. And so he had a leprous spiritual need that Jesus was trying to penetrate this uh, denial that he was living in. Well, there was also the man who was waiting for water to be stirred so he could be healed. And if you'd like to turn with me to John chapter 5, we'll take a look at that story, starting with verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, there was in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. 
At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. I think that Jesus knew what was going to happen. He excused himself. He didn't stick around for the fireworks. They were going to come later. But he left. And true to form, the Pharisees attacked Jesus because of his Sabbath keeping. Once they discovered it was, they attacked him, and I should say, in the presence of this um, healed individual. So think about it for a moment. This guy was paralyzed. Was it a metaphor for the people who heard about it, who were so critical? Were the Pharisees so paralyzed by their traditions that they need healing? I think so. They didn't recognize their need. Uh, they were paralyzed by the rules and regulations. And this man would become an illustration of Jesus' power in the life of those people who were paralyzed by tradition. We also understand that this man was the wor was uh, the worst of the worst case of of sickness that was there. So he was really he was going to get the, hit the ball out of the park, figuratively speaking. I mean, you couldn't miss this. He had been around for 38 years. He had been a suffering invalid, helpless. He needed people to help him. So everybody probably knew him. And so everybody probably heard the results of this incident. And I don't know if the man himself caught on, but did he begin to identify the paralysis in Judaism, especially as it was uh, articulated by the Pharisees? We don't know. But Sister White on page 206 in The Desire of Ages writes, he had chosen the Sabbath upon which to perform the act of healing in Bethesda. He could have healed the sick man as well on any other day of the week, or he might simply have cured him without bidding him bear away his bed. Now, that would have been the politically correct thing to have done, right? But this would not have given him the opportunity he desired. And then she makes this point, which I think is very significant. A wise purpose underlay every act of Christ's life on earth. Everything he did was important in itself and in its teaching. Among the afflicted ones at the pool, he selected the worst case upon whom to exercise his healing power and bade the man carry his bed through the city in order to publish the great work that had been wrought upon him. This would raise the question of what it was lawful to do on the Sabbath and would open the way for him to denounce the restrictions of the Jews in regard to the Lord's Day and to declare their traditions void. But Jesus' purpose-driven ministry sometimes does not fulfill our purpose-driven expectations of him. And Lazarus was, is, our, is our illustration of that. And in the story, it's really encouraging to me to see how evident it was to all those who are participating in this dialogue. The sisters, Mary and Martha, sent a message to Jesus. And the message was, the one that you love is sick. That's a wonderful thing to let soak into our heart to realize that Jesus in the, is in the business of compassionate love toward all of us. 
regardless of our situation. This story helps us not only realize that there is purpose in the miracle, but purpose in allowing delays to our expectations and to the answers, uh, a delay in answers to the prayers. The awareness of our own value in God's sight is never as great as when we may be singled out by Jesus for an exhibition of his mercy. But it goes on in the story. Um, I think John is the next one. I should be looking at the passage. Uh, I think it's verse 3 is the first one. Um, Oh, my wife warned me that this was going to happen. She offered to loan me her Bible, which has larger print. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick. So the second one was in verse 5, which is a commentary by John, the writer. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It's I don't know what significance there is to this, but in the... In the text, all of them, but this one, use the word phileo, which is brotherly love. John uses the word agape, and I'll let you decide whether that's significant or not. Uh, I wondered, but I don't know that I have an answer yet. But uh, he goes on in verse the story goes on in verse 11. Um, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our, fr our friend, and that's the word phileo, Jesus uses that word about Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And then in 36, which is after the shortest verse in the Bible where it says Jesus wept, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Isn't that interesting? Um, there are some who make the case that the word that's used, that's translated, uh, the Jews, is really a catchphrase for the Jewish leaders and uh, it's interesting that even the enemies, if they're honest, they can see that those who have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus loves them. It's, they may not see Jesus, but they see those who are touched by the love of Christ in their lives. So what happens when we pray? We send our request to Jesus. Lord, I'm struggling with this illness, with this health issue, with this challenge in my family. And then Jesus waits around. He waits for time to pass. We needed an answer the day we asked the question, but Jesus waits. And sometimes maybe he waits so long that we pass away before the answer is given. I think of George Mueller, who had, I think, five friends, or maybe four friends, who he was praying for. And one by one, they yielded up their lives to Christ, except for one. And that one didn't yield up his life to Christ until after George Mueller passed away. So we need not be discouraged. We need not think of ourselves as lacking in faith if our requests are not granted. If we believe Jesus loves us, we can have confidence in him and trust him with the things that we're concerned about. We can be tearfully overwhelmed by our children who may not have embraced Christ. We want, in the worst way, to see them embrace Christ. And we pray for them every day. Nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Then our funeral happens. Has Jesus forgotten? Well, to carry on and to illustrate this story, uh, we're going to watch a video. It's called 828. And for those who are watching online, you really need to go online to watch this because we can't show it to you because of copyright laws. So YouTube is the place, and 828 is the program. So we'll watch that together and close with a few comments.
I didn't see the text there, but in maybe a different version, a shorter version, uh, the passage was quoted from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And I've taken some editorial liberties to condense it, to make the point. And if I may share that with you. Um, where did we go? Here we go. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And I've inserted this, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. That's verse 29. Sometimes we just read 28 by itself, but you can tell from this story what the answer to prayer was. The answer to prayer is it's more about God's glory than our deliverance from being an invalid. It's about his grace that transforms us. And um, see the glory of the purpose that is being fulfilled uh, as co-workers with him. Now, they may not be hired by somebody, but their story is being communicated. And we may not be hired by somebody to tell our story, but if we have a walk with Jesus, we have answers to prayer, or we, 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 we express our concerns, and those concerns may not be realized, uh, we, we need to realize that he has answered our prayer. And he's going to give us grace to rise above whatever situation, however difficult it may be, however challenging it is. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have perfect love. And you want to impart that to us daily. You want to refresh our lives with that. And we know that uh, it's a, we're a work in progress because of the brokenness that we've inherited and cultivated. But we pray that we'll have hearts that yearn, that reach out to you for your healing power. And our hearts are encouraged by the many stories we read about Jesus and his healing power and how his heart of compassion was revealed to those who were so disadvantaged by the lives that they were living. We're so grateful for his compassion, and we know that just as they were the object of your love and your compassion, so we are as well. Even though, as illustrated in Lazarus' story, you did not live up to their expectations, but far exceeded them. And even though the delay may be long, should it be long, we pray that we'll continue with our faith in you, knowing that all is well in our soul. Thank you for your promises, your, your power, your plans. We thank you for Christ's purpose-driven ministry, not only when he was on earth, but his purpose-driven ministry as he interce intercedes for us uh, before your throne. So help us to trust you more and um, be transparent for you to work through and demonstrate your power in our lives. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.